from chapter 2 as we begin our worship this evening. Psalm chapter 2. This morning we talked about um, what happens when there are people who are non-Christians that attack the gospel. And tonight, as we continue that, um, we're going to be looking specifically about how um, we as believers need to respond. And we'll get there, but um, we're going to see that one of the things that um, Peter and John and the church did is they began quoting Scripture. And Psalm chapter 2 is the Scripture that they quoted. So I thought it would be good for us to start this evening with just a reminder of what this psalm says. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then He will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled." Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. It's an interesting call to worship, to be saying, we're here to worship the Lord. Let's read about how this is telling us to worship the Lord. And it says, O kings, be wise and be warned. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Let me remind you, brothers and sisters, that outside of Christ, His judgment is waiting for all of us. So we're here this morning this evening, we're here this evening, because we recognize that those who take refuge in Him are kept from His judgment. That very last phrase, blessed are all who take refuge in Him, we're singing tonight because we are taking refuge in Him. We're not destroyed as the kings and the nations and the peoples who plot in vain against the Lord and against His anointed because we've accepted His anointed. It's a wonderful call to praise. We praise because He has saved us. Even as sinners, He saved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are, we are gathered together as Your people again tonight to worship Your name, to sing Your praises, recognizing, Lord, that in our own, on our own, our even the things we think are good deeds are nothing but filthy rags. And you, Lord God, took us in our filthiness and in our rottenness, and you cleaned us and made us pure. Not because we are pure, but because you've given us your own purity. And so, Lord, we come tonight reminding ourselves and singing to you that we have taken refuge in your wings. We have come to live in the city that was built on the rock, knowing that only you could cleanse us from our brokenness, and knowing that you have chosen to do so. Help us, Lord, as we sing, for our minds and our hearts and our mouths to all be worshiping together, praising your name for what you've done. I pray that we as a church would love each other, serve each other. Bless this time, Lord God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Today in our hymn number 340, let's stand and sing, He Hideth My Soul. Number 340. Standing on the promise, number 335. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, who eternal ages made His praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, Standing on the cross. 
standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the house is torn from town and fear herself, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Number 338. Have firm the foundation, ye saints of the Lord. He has laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? Tonight, now at number 345, now I belong to Jesus. <clears throat>
committee for prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us the privilege to come to your house. We thank you, Lord, for the love and the grace and the mercy you bestow upon us each and every day. For your kindness, Father. Lord, not just for the salvation, Lord, that you have given us, but even the very desire that we have, Lord, to worship you, to, to study your word, to help others. All of that comes from you, Father. And Lord, I feel so ashamed so many times, God, because <clears throat> we become like Abraham and we say, well, Lord, you are not enough. We need this. We need that. And, Father, we just don't realize that you are all we need. Help me to remember that, Father. Not just this moment, not today. It's Sunday's easy. It's tomorrow. That's the test. Help us to remember that. Help us to shine forth your love for mankind in our thoughts and in our deeds. And Lord, if they reject it, so be it. You knew that. Help us to trust that. Be with us now, Lord, as we continue to worship. <clears throat> Honor the breaking of the bread of life, Lord that it be nourishment to our bones, Lord, that we would have that strength as we go through this week. And we will glorify and honor your name simply because it is worthy of all glory. Amen. You can be turning to, um, to Acts chapter 4, um, but while you, while you do that, there's, there's not, as I was sitting there worshiping um, and listening, hopefully as you do, to the words that we're singing, um, I was struck just how close what we sang is to, to what God's Word is about this evening. Um, and I, this is, I know this is going to sound awful, but my, my, as soon as we finish singing the song and start singing the next song, I don't think I could tell you what we had just finished singing. I just, I have a hard time going backwards. So I, I went and grabbed the music. But I want you to think about how Psalm chapter 2 ends with saying, we find refuge in Him. What's the first song? He hideth my soul. And we're singing about the very thing we just got finished reading about, that God in His mercy rescues us. Then we sang how firm a foundation. This morning we talked about what happens when you go to prison, what happens when things are tough. In verse 3, when though through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only endeavor, I only design thy dross to consume, thy gold to refine. Even there in the singing of the song, we're being reminded of something that I didn't even mention or plan to mention, but that is, is that in all of this, God's sovereignty is working not just for the good of, of not just for His glory, but also for my good. 
I don't understand why Peter and John needed a night in prison, but apparently they did. And God, in His infinite grace, was willing to give them even that for their goodness. And then we say, saying, standing on the promises. Again, when you go through trials and things are tough, if you don't know the promises of God, you have nothing to stand on and you're going to fall away. And then we sang a particular promise. Now I belong to Jesus. And so I wanted to do this some to tell, to tell the church what a blessing you have to have a, 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 someone who is leading us in worship that is praying about what to sing. Because I can tell you, we have not had the chance to sit down and discuss the individual points and what the sermon would be, and yet week after week after week, the things that Wayne picks to sing and the things that I'm preaching about line up so rightly. And that doesn't happen without the working of the Holy Spirit in both of us. And so you as a church, you should be very thankful to have someone who is leading you in worship that cares about what, is, what it is he's doing and is praying about the songs that we should sing. And I know that he would tell you this too. You should be praising God that God cares. And that as we seek to know him, there is a message he's teaching us. And yes, this is a huge part of what we do when we gather to, as Matt said, break the bread of life. And it's all part of the worship that we're giving. And God in His grace and His sovereignty is allowing the things that we sing and the things that are said together to be us talking to Him and Him talking to us. And hopefully you're built up and encouraged. And again, I just can't help but say, Wayne, thank you for being obedient because I know that this doesn't come without your desire to seek Him. Acts chapter 4. I'm going to back up a little bit and read some of what we read last time. Just, just so we're all on the same page, there was a miracle, a miraculous event that God did where a man who had been lame all of a sudden is now walking. And God did it. God did a miracle. And so he's leaping and praising God. Running and leaping and praising God. And a great crowd of people recognized him as a beggar that used to sit at the gate. And so they gathered around and they said, how, is it, can, how can this be that this lame man is up and walking? And Peter and John stood up and said, we'll tell you how. God, Jesus is how this has happened. And you and your rulers, you crucified him, but he came back from the dead, and if you'll trust him, he'll save you from their sins. And the Bible tells us that the number of Christians came to be 5,000 at that point. And so we are saying that somewhere around 2,000 people were saved because of that event. And yet, as that event concludes, what we see is the chief priest rushing up with the Sadducees and with the captain of the temple guard and arrested Peter and... Um, and John, and threw them into prison. And the next day they brought them before the council, and Peter and John were given an opportunity by God to preach to the leaders of the nation. And I can guarantee you the leaders of the nation were not accepting invitations to listen to the gospel, but God made it so that they would. And so we saw the third sermon. <laughs> the third sermon was a, re a recognition of who God is. Again, that Jesus, that they had killed Jesus, but Jesus would still save them from their sins. And we saw their rejection to that message this morning. The last point from this morning is some people might reject Jesus. And we saw how they did that. That they recognized that the disciples were different. They recognized that Jesus changed the disciples, they had nothing that they could say in opposition to the miracle or the things that, Jesus, that they were saying. They even recognized that a miracle occurred, and yet in all of that, they still rejected Christ's message of for forgiveness and repentance. And not only that, at that point, they quit listening. 
So let's pick up now in Acts chapter 4, 4 verse 18. So they called them, the they are the Jewish leaders, and the them are Peter and John. So the Jewish leaders called Peter and John and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So in verse 18, we see three things that they did. The first thing they did is they tried to intimidate. They, they charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Then we see them in verse 21, threaten. When they had further threatened them, they let them go. And then we also see that they would have gone even further than that. They would have attacked them. Because it says, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. What stayed their hand was not that they didn't think that they ought to punish Peter and John, is that they couldn't because the crowd wouldn't let them. And so I get from that, I think, rightly, and, and, for, and we'll see that it will happen later on, that we understand that when people reject the gospel, they often turn to attack the messenger. I, I can't help but think about there. You know that there is a man in North America, in Canada, that is going to be in prison until May. And his crime is that he, he is not going to turn people away from coming to his church to worship on Sunday morning. That's his crime. They said that his church is, has too many people in it because of COVID and because of health restrictions. And, and although everyone in it is coming of their own free will, he's, uh, and his statement is, is not any kind of judgment about whether to wear masks or not. All he has said is that I'm going to preach the word in person and I'm not going to tell people they're not allowed to come. And because of that, he went up for bail this week and it was denied. So he will not even be out on bail. He will be in prison away from his kids and away from his wife until May. Do not think that we are so far behind And we need to be ready. And my prayer, my, my earnest prayer is that when it comes, that we also will be able to see the response of people accepting Christ. Something interesting that's happening at that church, and I don't know, I don't know his theology, I know very little about this pastor. And we know what dangers we can get into, into worshiping people. So I'm not trying to say that he is above all bad things that he could ever think or do, but I, it is interesting to me that it sounds like the church is absolutely packed every week, and they are still meeting in person. I pray that I'm never thrown in jail for preaching the gospel, but even more so, I pray that if I am that my obedience will, that the Lord will use my obedience for many to come to his kingdom. Amen. Peter and John were able to go to sleep in the, in the prison knowing that thousands had come to Christ because the Spirit moved. I don't know if they slept or not. May we have that kind of understanding. And this is a, this is a precursor of what's to come.
Okay, so what happens here, we're going to see in a couple of chapters they're actually going to be beat. Eventually we'll see that they're actually starting to kill um, Christians. Um, this is just the beginning of what it's going to look like to disagree with the chief priest when it comes to Christ. But there, is some, there are some things here that are very instructive for how they handled what happened. Verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus." And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of the Lord with boldness. What is our response to attacks? How do we handle when things are hard? The first thing, I said this this morning, but I think it's worth going back, that I think we need to be honest. Our intentions need to be up front. In verse 19, Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. When the attack came, and the threatening and the intimidation and all that happened, what they said is, look, I see that we have a disagreement. I hear what you're saying. You're telling me not to um, keep going. And I have to tell you, we're going to. Of all the boldness that they showed, this is, a, this is hugely bold. And it should, you should recognize this, that when this comes in your own life, this is going to be tough. It's much easier to be kind to their face and then turn around and do all your plotting behind their back. But that's not kind to be dishonest. What is kind is to look them in the eyes and say, you about this subject, you are wrong. And I can only do what I've been told to do. Your intentions need to be up front. We are not allowed to fight like the world fights. The rest of the world is really good at sneak attacks. Don't let people know until you've got all your stuff. It just We're not allowed that. We need to be up front. The second thing that we see them doing in verse 23, when they were released, where did they go? They went to their friends. Who are their friends? The church. When you struggle with things that are going on, where should you bring your struggles? Here, to each other. Not to the church as some sort of um, global unit, but to your friends, which are the body of Christ. Go to the church. Then after going to the church, where did they go next? Together to God. Verse 24, And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. It is so easy to do everything in the world except pray. Matter of fact, I wrestle with this on, on Wednesday nights sometimes. Sometimes I think we, well, we call Wednesday night prayer meeting, 
And yet the amount of time that we spend praying is often a lot less than the amount of time we spend talking about praying. And there's reasons for it, and I'm not saying that we're going to be able to just instantly not do that anymore, but just, just understand that notice what the pattern was. They came to the church, their friends, they explained what went on, and then they prayed. That was part of their response. What was their prayer? Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Before going anywhere with talking about their concerns, they recognized that God was in control and that God is the creator of all things. You will not handle difficulty in your life if you don't understand that God is in control. You have to start there. You have to recognize, you have to be able to say that the night in prison is also in God's hand. That being beat by the Sanhedrin, which is what it'll eventually come to, is also in God's hands. That the good and the bad is all in God's hand. Not that he causes evil, but he definitely uses it for his glory. Even the crucifixion of the Savior of the most innocent person in the world, God took that evil event and turned it into good and His glory. And that has been His pattern throughout. And when, you, when we go through hard times, it's very easy to say, why, God, are you allowing this to happen? That is a, a worthwhile question. But never think that it's happening because it's outside of his control. It is in his control. And when they come back, they begin with saying, Sovereign Lord, you made everything. Not only did you make everything, but in verse 25, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Not only did God make the world, but God even predicted that this would occur. And that's the next thing I would say. Go to God, go also to Scripture. Do you see what they're doing here? We read the whole chapter in its entirety at the beginning of the service. This is Psalm chapter 2. You want to stand under the trials that come? You had better have some understanding of Scripture because that's where you're going to need to lean. They're able to understand that God is the creator of all because they've read Genesis and they know that God made everything. They're able to understand that what's happening in their days is a fulfillment of what God said would happen because they've read Psalm 2. And now they're going to God and they're remembering what God has told them through Scripture. And then they do something that I think is, is very instructive. Verse 25, we see them talking about the psalm. David, our father David, your servant, said this by the Holy Spirit. And then let me read it again. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. That's the scripture. And then in verse 27, as they continued their prayer, for truly in this day there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Do you see what they did? What they read in Psalm chapter 2, they recognized was being fulfilled in Acts, well, in, in the Gospels, in their life, in today. They applied the scripture that they read for today. Now, I want to say this very cautiously, because Psalm chapter 2 is specifically talking about the Gentiles raging against the anointed. I don't believe there, are, there is any other time in history that better fulfilled Psalm chapter 2 than when the chief, well, when Pontius Pilate and Herod, both of who are Gentiles, attacked and killed Jesus, who was the anointed. 
Okay, so we, we need to be careful students of the word. What they did and the application that they made, there is no other time in history that it is so clear that the kings of the earth raged and the Gentiles plotted in vain against the Lord and against his anointed as at those days when they crucified Jesus. Okay? But having said that, what we can learn in our own lives is that we also need to make sure that what is going on is a correct understanding of what Scripture said. In other words, I hate to use someone else's pain as an example, but looking at this man in Canada who is in prison, and again, I am not going to sit in judge in either direction. I don't know the story, and I think it's very dangerous to try to say we know what's going on in other people's lives who live thousands of miles away. Okay? But if I were in that boat, I would be remembering, of course, all of the believers who have been to prison, but I also need to be searching the Scriptures to make sure that Scripture really does apply to me. But that said, there is no other way to go. When we walk through the world, we have to take the Scripture and apply it to our own lives. What is going on today? And that's what they did. And then they asked God, verse 29, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Lord. The, to speak the word of, the, of God with boldness. Their request to God was for three things. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. The first thing they said is, Lord... <laughs> You know what we're looking at. There are threats against our life, and yet we know you've called us to speak. <laughs> Heavenly Father, creator of the world, the one who holds all things in your hands, you know how easy it would be for us to be intimidated by this. And so, God, we pray that you would grant us boldness, that we would be faithful in what we know you have called us to do. That's the first thing. Secondly, they prayed for protection. You might be saying to yourself that if, it were in, if you were in that boat, you probably would start with the protection part. The temptation is there. <laughs> But I want you to notice, even in protection, I think one of the most dangerous prayers that we pray in, in the United States is, Lord, keep us safe. Because I think we have turned our safety into a God, and what we really care about is just not being in anything that's ever uncomfortable. Notice that their prayer for protection was not a blanket, just make me have a nice life. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They are pray praying for protection against the threats, but that protection against the threats has a reason, and the reason is so that they continue to preach. This is the... <laughs> So many times when I preach, what I preach is bigger than me. I don't know that I'm there yet. I don't know that I can say, in all honesty, Lord, if, if there were real hard times coming, it's okay if I get hurt as long as your name still gets preached. What their prayer was is, Lord, you protect us against their threats so that we can be faithful to do what you've called us to do. Heavenly Father, keep us where we can do your will. 
And that comes back around to, I think, one of the major things over the last three weeks that has been impressed on me through looking at Acts, and that is the recognition that we don't do, God does. Because where their prayer finishes is, Lord, <laughs> Lord, protect us from their threats, give us boldness, let the message still go out, but then, while you, verse 30, while you Holy Father, while you, God, continue to stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. What they prayed for is that his spirit would still be there. In their day, what that looked like was miraculous healings that nobody could deny was the power of God. May it be in our day as well. But what we need above all is the movement of the Spirit. And our prayers should be that way. Heavenly Father, send your Spirit and move. Clear the path so we can be obedient. But Heavenly Father, we know you are the one who moves. You are the one who stretches out your hand. You're the one who heals. You're the one who does signs and wonders. And it's all in the name of Jesus. Now I'd love to tell you that the, the end of the story is that Peter and John lived a wonderful, comfortable life. But they were honored because they chose to follow the Lord. And the world recognized just what a treasure it was to have such wonderful people willing to follow the Lord. But we know that is not the story. Tradition tells us that not only was Peter crucified, but he was crucified up, upside down after having watched his wife be crucified. John, tradition tells us, is the last of the disciples to be killed. So his was not the quick martyrdom, but the slow martyrdom. Boiled in oil, left on the Isle of Patmos. <laughs> Today we'd call it deplatformed. Put into some place where um, no one would be able to hear his message, which is not his message, it's God's message. So I can't tell you on the authority of God's word that when you trust him that it makes your life safe. Matter of fact, this prayer for protection, oh, they got their message out, but they were not kept safe. And at least not the way we consider safe. But God did continue to work and signs and wonders. And the church continued to grow. And God fulfilled in them what he promised he would do in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That they were his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What does it mean to follow God? We began praising the Lord. He hideth my soul in the depths of his love. Hideth his soul, what is it? In the cleft of the rock. Hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. That doesn't mean safety here. And it doesn't mean pain-free living. It means tough stuff. Verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we live among a culture that hates you. They have denied you as creator. They want to live, they want to deny any rule that they can find that you might have said. And Lord, we could go through a long list of ways that they have demonstrated their, their hatred. And yet, Lord, in the middle of this world, you've placed us with the, the same command that you gave to the apostles, that we are to be your witnesses. Lord, we know that with that will come persecutions and trials. Lord, we know that the temptation will be to lose our boldness, to cave. Matter of fact, Lord, I know that without your spirit working in my life, I will do that. Lord, I pray for this body of believers, for our church. That you, you would do exactly what you did in Peter and John's life. That as they sought you, as they acknowledged your sovereignty and your power and your control, and as they prayed, that you would help them to be bold and you would protect them so that your name would grow out. In the middle of that, you came and you shook the place. And you gave them great boldness. So much so, Lord, that when we talk about this book that we call the Acts of the Apostles, we recognize what we really see is the Acts of the Holy Spirit moving in the Apostles. Oh, God, do that here. Glorify your great name. Glorify your Son. Protect us, Lord, not so that we're safe, but so that we can be faithful to do what you've called us to do and fill us with your spirit so that we do it with boldness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Number 305.
Is there a word this evening? Johnny, will you close us in prayer?